So it turns out that many anti-cancer drugs, which target these pathways that prevent the cell from dying, which then leads to cell death, will kill a tumor cell, but also kill a senescent cell. Human OS. Learn. Master. Achieve. Welcome back, everybody. I'd like to welcome Dr. Paul Robbins to HumanOS Radio. Paul is a professor in biology and aging at University of Minnesota, Department of Molecular Medicine. His work focuses on the role of inflammation in aging and the discovery of chemical agents that might influence the aging process. And as you are no doubt aware, humans are living longer than ever before, but the incidence of chronic degenerative disease increases exponentially around the age of 65. Why then? So for decades now, medicine has been targeting symptoms of aging process, which are chronic diseases like diabetes, et cetera. But what if we targeted the aging process itself rather than trying to treat individual diseases as they arise? Might we make more progress successfully dealing with these conditions if we think outside of the disease paradigm? It is my opinion that the next major step function improvement in human health will come from the field of aging research. And the exciting thing is that real solutions seem near. In fact, clearing Senescent cells using compounds known as senolytics has been shown to alleviate age-related diseases and signs, think reversal of gray hair, and even extend lifespan in some animal models uh, where it has been tested. So, Paul, welcome to Humanist Radio. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Dan. It's my pleasure to be here. I covered senescence in an earlier show with Judith Campisi from the Buck Institute, but as a quick refresher, tell our audience what senescent cells are and how they form and why they're bad. Yeah, so Judy is really the world's expert on this and just uh, joined the National Academy because of her work on senescence. But uh, probably what she mentioned was that senescence is a process when cells become damaged or if they start to grow uncontrollably or if they replicate too much, a system kicks on to cause that cell to go into irreversible growth arrest. And then we'll send out signals to the immune system to come to get rid of it. So it's like an alarm signal saying this cell's damaged, this cell's bad, this is a cell that's potentially cancerous, and the immune system is supposed to come clear it. The problem is, is that as we age and our immune system starts to fail, we accumulate more and more damage, the senescent cells percent starts to increase, and our immune system doesn't clear them at the same rate. So you have bad cells in your body releasing bad factors, telling the immune system to come get rid of them, and the immune system is not. And it appears that these bad factors that they release can contribute to driving aging. What is a senolytic compound? There were several landmark papers published out of the Mayo Clinic by Jan van Dersen and Jim Kirkland using the transgenic mouse model where they could clear or eliminate these damaged cells, at least in the mouse model, using a genetic trick. And Mm -hmm. in several papers, high-profile papers, they showed that clearing these cells improved the health span of these mice and even improved the median lifespan, not maximal. So that led to a lot of excitement saying, well, if this works in mice, can we identify drugs that mimic the genetic trick that was done by Jim and Jan? And so my lab, actually in collaboration with Jim Kirkland and others, developed cell culture or laboratory models where we could now screen for drugs that might kill these damaged cells specifically and not affect the normal cells. And so in the screen of compounds, and we did this using a screen of compounds which are already used clinically, we actually identified a number of agents that could specifically lead to death of the damaged cells without affecting the normal cells. And so we termed those senolytics. We also identified compounds that may reverse or dampen some of these senescent phenotype characteristics and we call these senomorphics because they kind of change the morphology of the cells. And so senomorphics and senolytics, we've classified as what are called senotherapeutics. So targeting senescent cells with therapeutic agents that either would kill them or suppress some of the bad factors that they're secreting that seem to be involved in driving aging. One of the reasons why the accumulation of senescent cells is bad is because they release factors into their surrounding and raise the general level of inflammation in the bodies. Yes. So these senescent cells release inflammatory factors, but they also release proteases, presumably to allow the immune cells to be able to infiltrate into the tissue and clear them. So they actually partially degrade the environment around them. And so between the proteases and the inflammatory factors, this can lead to chronic inflammation, but also tissue degeneration or lost homeostasis with age. 
senolytic compounds electively clear senescent cells, senolytic morphics convert what they're emitting right. in the environment. And so either way, you end up with a better situation than you had previously. I think the only difference is drugs that kill senescent cells could be taken intermittently. So you could treat an individual, as we've shown in mice, you could treat an individual and then wait two or three months until the senescent cell burden comes back. Whereas mm -hmm. with something that suppresses what the senescent cells are doing, you probably have to take chronically because mm -hmm. you have to continually suppress that. And it may be that both approaches might be required to really get the optimal effect, but that's to be determined in the clinic. What were some of the deleterious effects that you see when you implant these senescent cells? Right. So there are two ways to show senescent cells contributed to driving aging. One was to show if you clear them, the mice or the rodent systems were healthier. The other approach, conversely, as you just mentioned, was is you could actually inject senescent cells into a young mouse and look and see what changes those senescent cells contribute to. And what was shown, and this was mostly done by Jim Kirkland at the Mayo Clinic and published in a recent paper in Nature Medicine, if you inject senescent preadipocytes, so these are actually progenitor cells from fat that have been irradiated to cause damage to make them senescent. Mm. If you inject them, they actually would drive signs of frailty, you would see altered metabolism, and you see changes in tissue histology that are mm. consistent with aging. Mm. So this would show that the senescent cells are sufficient to actually drive aspects of aging. And that's very exciting because for many years, it was thought these cells were more of a consequence of aging, right. but not the, uh, something which was driving aging. But now it appears that these cells are playing a, a significant role. And the other interesting observation was made is that these senescent cells seem to lead to dysfunction of endogenous stem cells. So it's been reported that if you clear these senescent cells, the endogenous stem cells that are involved in repairing damaged tissues, these are adult stem cells that are found in every tissue in the body, these cells are healthier and they could actually facilitate repair of tissue more readily. Mm -hmm. So you might actually see, and I don't want to use regeneration or reversal of aging, but if these stem cells become more functional, you might see improvement um, and not just slowing the aging process. That's really exciting. I mean, one thing that seems clear with the aging process is the loss and degradation of healthy tissues. So sarcopenia is an example. That might be seemingly due to the increased inflammatory burden that maybe is contributing to these stem cells not differentiating into new tissues. So you just have a loss right. of them overall. Right. So we definitely see that senescent cells increase with age, but we didn't know to what degree they contributed or just epiphenomenal to the aging process. But because of your model of injecting senescent cells into younger animals, you could see that it was causative of age-related loss of function. And that gave you more confidence to how much these are involved in the negative effects of aging itself. But I think one of the important points I should make is that we show if you inject a lot of senescent cells into a mouse, it drives aging. One of the big questions is what senescent cells in an aging animal or aging human contribute to driving aging is a senescent kidney cell, a senescent muscle cell, a senescent liver cell, a senescent mm -hmm. brain cell, or as I think some of our data is starting to show, it's actually senescent immune cells because they can traffic throughout the body. And so if they're making bad factors, they actually can be all the places in the body where you might not want bad cells to be. Right. So it may be immune cells are doing this, or it may be other types of cells. And so many groups are now going research-wise is starting to look at clearing senescent cells in a tissue-specific way or causing senescence in a tissue-specific way. And then what's the contribution? Not injecting cells, which is somewhat artificial, but can you increase senescence or eliminate senescence of specific cell types? And that is going to be very informative. So we then know what drugs we should be developing to target that subset of senescent cells. So that's a very interesting point and one that I hadn't thought about previously. I'd always thought about the senolytics as going into the body and then sort of replacing what the immune system was no longer doing as effectively. But if I'm understanding you correctly, the senolytics could have the potential of also improving the efficacy of the immune system. So you could have a dual benefit of having a direct effect on senescent cells in the body, but also making the immune system better at doing what it had done previously. Right. And it may be even non senolytic drugs. Obviously, for cancer therapies, there's a lot of immunotherapies that are being developed right. to optimize or improve T cell function or other components of the immune response. And so those, and it's still to be proven, but those also could have uh, potential benefits. Yeah. They can improve the ability of the immune system to clear the senescent cells. And it appears that senescent cells also, I won't say evolve in the body, but 
as we age, they seem to have developed ways to avoid the immune system too. So it's going to be a really interesting set of questions that need to be addressed about the roles of what cell types drive aging and then how the immune system either clears or doesn't clear them effectively with age. Mm-hmm. And if we can really work out both of those areas, I think very effective drugs can be developed, which probably would include senolytics, but also other types. It may also include using stem cells or some of the regenerative factors that stem cells release too. So I think eventually there'll be a cocktail of agents, and they're not all going to be small molecules. Some may be biologic, some may even be cells that you could administer every so often to improve or slow down the aging process. That's so interesting. It makes me think about the interview that I did with Mike and Arena Convoy from UC Berkeley, Mm. where they had done parabiosis of old and young mice. So for the listener, that means sewing together an old and a young mouse. And what they originally found is that the young mouse became older, the old mouse became younger. So this has given rise to this idea of young blood. Could young blood and factors that are contained within it do something positive to an older phenotype to reverse it? The most potent effect was actually the older mouse aging the younger mouse. And they think that it might be some specific factors that are released from the senescent cells that are driving that process. So there's factors that the old mice have actually drive aging in young mice, but conversely, there are factors in young blood that slow aging in older mice. And so we are have a story about ready to publish where we've shown in parabiosis, if you put old and young mice together, you see less senescence in the old mouse and more senescence in the younger ones. So you kind of get this intermediate phenotype. And there have been clinical trials started at Stanford by Tony Weiss Corey using yeah. young plasma into the elderly people with at least early stage Alzheimer's. And he's treated a certain number of patients. The phase one trial has been done and some of the data has been presented. And I think they've seen some positive results maybe not as effective as they had hoped. But the question comes is how often do you have to give the young plasma? Is it once a month? You know, is how much? Certain age of the donor? There's a lot of questions. And so where a lot of groups are going is trying to identify what those good factors are in Mm. young serum that can reduce senescence, appear to improve stem cell function, and as Tony weiss Corey has shown, actually improve cognitive ability. That was what he had published in several nice papers, was that young plasma or in heterochronic parapiosis improves cognitive ability of the older animal, which is very exciting. Absolutely. And that speaks to a broader trend of what I'm seeing, which is that there are promising aging compounds, rapamycin and protocols, fasting, but what is the frequency that you need to then employ these strategies once a quarter? once a month. And obviously, we just haven't had the time to investigate all of these strategies and whether or not we found the perfect protocol for a person at a given age. Biomarkers are still going to be a big part of this so that you can assess degree of improvement or change in this biomarker, then we're seeing the effect that we want. And that's going to take some time to figure out. Yeah. So, you know, I talked about young serum improving cognitive ability in older mice. Well, there were actually two papers that have come out this last month that showed that senolytics improve pathology and behavior in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. There was a paper that came out in Nature this week from Darren Baker at the Mayo Clinic showing that if you can clear these senescent cells, either using a genetic trick or with a specific drug, and this is a drug called Nevitoclax, it's an anti-cancer drug that targets BCL2 family of anti-apatotic proteins. He saw dramatic improvement, and then the month before, Miranda Orr from the Barshop Institute has shown that the combination of drugs we identified with Jim Kirkland, the satin and quercetin also showed a reduction in senescence in the brain and improvement in pathology in a mouse model of Alzheimer's. So I think that there are different approaches that can be taken to improve cognitive ability and potentially even treat Alzheimer's, which has been very difficult to treat. Everything goes works in mice, but then doesn't work in humans. But the preclinical data with both senolytics and with young plasma look very promising. And so there's hope that we're going to see some positive results as this moves into the clinic. It seems like two different classes of compounds have emerged for classically chemotherapy drugs and then plant phytochemicals like flavonoids, particularly the facetin, Judith Campisi studied apigen and quercetin, of course. So talk to us about the combination of satinib and quercetin. That seems to have taken hold and has been studied now multiple times. Why that combo? So the way these were identified, at least these two classes of compounds, was by a bioinformatic approach. And so this started at the Mayo Clinic, and then we picked up the project with Dr. Kirkland to demonstrate that the drugs really did work in the mouse model to eliminate senescent cells. But the concept was, is he actually analyzed molecularly a senescent cell 
and compared it to a normal cell. And the first thing that came out was that molecularly, there are many changes in the senescent cell that are similar to a cancer cell. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, the senescent cells have a lot of damage. And what mm -hmm. usually happens to damaged cells is they die. In our body, that's how we thought that most of the damaged cells were eliminated, is they just die. They induce kind of a self-death pathway called apoptosis. But senescent cells upregulate certain pathways that prevent them from dying. And these pathways are actually very similar to a cancer cell, which when the cancer cell starts to proliferate, it has to survive because usually there's systems such as a senescent pathway that tells it to stop. And so kind of early stage tumor cells and senescent cells look very similar. And so it turns out that many anti-cancer drugs, which target these pathways that prevent the cell from dying, which then leads to cell death, will kill a tumor cell, but also kill a senescent cell. And so desatinib is FDA-approved clinical-use compound for lymphomas and leukemias. It's what you take if you fail Gleevec or for certain other indications, it's the first-line treatment. But desatinib, turns out, will kill tumor cells and it will also kill certain types of senescent cells. Not all, but some. So look at the bioinformatic analysis, we identified the pathways which desatinib targets, but there are other pathways which are also upregulated. And one of them has been shown to be targeted by quercetin, which is a flavonoid, which probably does a hundred different things. But one of the things of it does is it targets an enzyme called PI3 kinase delta, mm -hmm. which was shown to be upregulated in the senescent cell type we were looking at. And we showed that in those cells, the combination was more effective at inducing cell death. Mm -hmm. Not true in all types of senescent cells. Some cells, desatinib was is effective alone. Other cell types, quercetin was effective alone. But we showed this combination among a broad spectrum of senescent cells was usually more effective. Mm -hmm. And then we put this into animals. We showed that this combination reduced senescent cell burden fairly dramatically, which was somewhat surprising because I don't think the satinib is the optimal senolytic. It was just the first one that we tested based on the bioinformatic analysis. And so I think it can be improved upon tremendously. But what has been somewhat surprising and, and actually very pleasing is that in a number of different animal models, that combination is shown to be the most effective combination as compared to Nevitoclax or some of the others that we've identified. And the reasons for that are still not quite clear, but it may be the specific targets for desatinib may really turn out to be the best targets. And these are receptors on the surface of the tumor cell or receptors on the surface of the senescent cell that seem to send survival signals. So that helps the cells survive. If you block them, the cells then die fairly quickly and fairly efficiently. So this combination has been very interesting. It's been very successful in a number of different labs, a number of different models. And we know the safety profile because it's been given to hundreds of thousands of cancer patients, even some who take this chronically. I've met individuals who've been on desatinib chronically for five, six years mm -hmm. with, I can't say no side effects, but limited side effects. So I think it's a field in its infancy, but desatinib, quercetin, nevitoclax, some of the other drugs, it's all very exciting. Do we have any resolution into the contribution of senolytic effect from the two different compounds, quercetin and desatinib, or do we really just know the total clearance that the combo induces? Yeah, I think, again, it depends on the type of senescent cell. And I think so we're going to have the tools to look at the different types of senescent cells carefully in vivo. Yeah. So overall, senescent cell burden is what you're looking at by markers that they secrete into the blood. And the combination clearly seems to work better. But I imagine there's some cells that the satinib is killing more effectively, some quercetin. And then together, the spectrum is even greater. So these are experiments that we're doing to try to identify the targets and then try to optimize drugs or optimize the combination against those specific senescent cells. Let's talk about a compound that I am very interested in, have written about here and there over the last couple of years, which is facetin. I've mentioned it before. Right. But it's like quercetin. It's a flavonoid found in the highest concentrations in strawberries, but also in apples and persimmons and onions and cucumbers. I know that you're doing a clinical trial with this now. What's the preclinical work that made you excited to test this specific compound by itself as a monotherapy? And do we know anything about how it differs from, let's say, quercetin? Out of all right. of is this going to be the most right. robust? Great question. So we have published, and we have a paper in press that I don't want to talk too much about because it's still in press, and there's supposedly an embargo on the press release. But what we have published was the facetin seems to work more effectively than quercetin as a senolytic in certain cell types. Mm. And we have confirmed that result that was published in the journal Aging last year, and now have extended it into different mouse models of aging, both natural aging and accelerated aging. And I can just say at this point, we've seen very positive results. 
which have led to Jim Kirkland at the Mayo Clinic starting clinical trials, mostly to document the facet and indeed eliminate senescent cells in humans. So mm-hmm. these have taken age-related diseases such as pulmonary fibrosis, individuals who have had high-dose chemotherapy or radiation for cancer that we know have a lot of damaged cells in their body. Also chronic kidney disease, where you see accumulation of senescent cells in the kidney. And now he's comparing facetin in some of these clinical trials with the facetinib and quercetin in others. But it's more to really show that he's reducing the senescent cell burden, and then we'll be looking at therapeutic endpoints going forward. And these trials are ongoing. I'm not a clinician, not directly involved with them, but I think there will be data, hopefully positive, of coming out within the next six months to a year. And you asked about facetin and quercetin. They're very similar. There's yeah. not much difference between them. So it's very interesting. And so one of the things we're doing is we're doing medicinal chemistry on quercetin and facetin to look at analogs and try to identify how these small differences influence the effect of facetin on senescent cells. And minor changes in the structure of quercetin or facetin can change its activity dramatically. Hmm. We can increase the stenolytic activity a certain number of fold with small changes in the compound. So we hope to be making better flavonoids as we go forward Hmm. with a greater safety window. So less of an effect on normal cells, but a greater effect on the senescent cell. I mean, that's our goal at this point. Give us a little overview of what's happening in biotech now on senolytics. Right. So it's been interesting in the biotech field, in the aging space, because for many, many years, nobody wanted to touch aging because it was not considered Mm -hmm a disease. And so the FDA really wouldn't grant approval for a drug for aging. And so that's the reason a lot of nutraceuticals propped up, sold on late night TV. But the FDA is starting to now to appreciate that aging is the biggest risk factor for most diseases. And so has reviewed and has approved the first clinical trial for aging, which is a trial that's starting run by near Barzilai, Albert Einstein, using metformin as the first potential anti-aging drug. So they have designed a study to really show that metformin, which is used for type 2 diabetes, and there's data showing type 2 diabetics actually may live a little bit longer than age-matched non-diabetics not on Mm -hmm. metformin. So metformin is the first drug going forward. And so this has kind of opened up the space. People are saying, aha, we might be able to do clinical trials for aging. And so Unity Biotechnology was the first company that sprung up in the senolytic space, started out of the Mayo Clinic and out of the Buck by Judy Campisi and Jan van Dersen. And they have started a clinical trial for osteoarthritis with a compound, Naviticlax, that targets this BCL2 family of antipatotic proteins. So they're doing intraarticular injection for OA, which has been shown to actually be driven in part by senescence. There are a lot of senescent chondrocytes that lead to cartilage damage. And with Unity having started and recently gone public, other companies are now springing up. And so we have probably four or five senolytic companies and probably others coming. Everybody has a compound they think might eliminate senescent cells, mostly in the laboratory, not necessarily in animal models or in the clinic yet. But there's a lot of new companies that are thinking this is where the future is going to be because we can treat not only a disease, we can maybe slow down or prevent onset of numerous diseases. And so the space is starting to take off. Yeah. So just to surface that big point there, for the first time, the FDA is supporting a trial that is specifically in aging and not just on a chronic disease. And that's opening the door for other studies and compounds to be tested specifically for aging. And that's a big deal. That's correct. So the metformin trial is called the TAME trial for targeting aging with metformin, which will be very interesting to see how that turns out. And then Unity's trial targeting osteoarthritis, again, with a senolytic, and then Jim Kirkland's trial using the compounds we've spoken about for other age-related conditions. So talk a little bit about rapamycin, because I know that's a very hot topic in this field and one that is being investigated. What do you know about the work that's happening there? Right. So rapamycin has received a lot of interest because it was the first compound shown by an NIH-funded testing program where three different laboratories around the country were testing a certain number of compounds a year for ability to extend lifespan in male mice and female mice. And the first hit that these three laboratories got was rapamycin, Mm. which was shown to extend lifespan in males and females, because many drugs might work in one sex and not the other for reasons we still don't understand. Mm -hmm. But rapamycin 
clearly extended lifespan. And then people have gone on to show that you don't have to give it chronically. You can give it intermittently and you can even start treatment towards end of life. And so there are now clinical trials starting with rapamycin for certain indications and a lot of effort put into developing what are called rapalogs. So these are compounds that work similarly to rapamycin, but which may not have some of the side effects mm -hmm. of rapamycin. And I think one of the important studies that was done by Novartis several years ago was a study where they showed that rapamycin treatment for a short period of time in the elderly led to a better immune response to the flu vaccine. So they actually could stimulate the immune response by treating with a low dose, certain dose, high doses want to do this, a rapamycin in showing their immune system is now better. And this has ramifications for more than just the flu vaccine. And so they're now extending these studies, I think, to look more at other age-related phenotypes. So rapamycin is a drug that potentially has a large role in this aging space. It's just rapamycin has had some side effects affecting metabolism and then in males, it's been shown in some cases at high doses to cause testicular atrophy, which is not something that you want to develop if you take rapamycin chronically. So there are going to be better rapalogs developed and then find the right dosing regimen. But I think those are going to be identified. A lot of men who are on testosterone replacement therapy live with that side effect regularly. Right. And so if it causes that, but without pathology, I bet a lot of people would would live with it. But yeah, if you can avoid it, that's great. So if we look out at the next 15, 20 years, with all the work that's happening, if you were a gambling man, where do you think that we're going to see the first approval? And then what do you think are sort of the most promising areas, given what we know now about affecting the aging process directly? I'm always an optimist. So I'm always one that think it's going to happen faster and maybe to a greater extent than the May. But this field is just taking off. And so I think clearly analytics, either the ones that we've identified now or more likely more optimal ones, clearly will play a role in treating age-related conditions. I mean, this could go anywhere from skin creams to slow aging, the appearance of aging, the systemic treatments or a whole spectrum of conditions, or as well as starting in maybe midlife to a little bit later in age individuals to slow the aging process itself. But I think that there's going to be no one type of drug that's going to have a huge effect. It's all going to be somewhat incremental. So it's really going to be coming, as we talked about earlier, a cocktail of therapeutics. And so I think things targeting senescent cells, maybe suppressing the factors they secrete. If you don't kill them all, get rid of the bad factors. Things improving mitochondrial function, things which may promote regeneration. And so I mentioned that there's evidence that stem cells can be improved if you treat mice with senolytics. We've also shown if you inject young stem cells into older mice and improves their slows their aging and improves certain functions. So I think that stem cell-based therapies or at least stem cell factor-based therapies with senolytics, with potentially antioxidants, potentially other classes of drugs, eventually you're going to have the right cocktail. So again, it'll be one pill or a set of pills you take every so often that's really going to make you healthier, extend health span. And then the big question is if you extend health span, how much is that going to extend lifespan? And that's going to be a big question. But I think health span clearly is going to be extended. So we're not in the nursing homes. We're not in emergency rooms. We're not bedridden. Hopefully we're out playing golf and tennis or whatever else we want to be doing. You mentioned that at the beginning when we we're talking about how the some of the animal models, the median lifespan increased, but without changing the maximal lifespan. And so when we think of the science fiction possibilities of therapies that can actually make us live beyond maximal human lifespan, that is estimated to be around 125 years. So like the conditions were absolutely perfect. That's about the extent to which humans could live. And some therapies could maybe take us to 150, but that is maximal lifespan. Median lifespan just means how would you translate an improvement in median lifespan? Well, I think the extension of median lifespan really reflects the extension of health span. That hasn't always been shown, but that's the way we've interpreted it. And there's some data to support that. If you look at these mice, they're living a little bit longer. They're all living longer and a little bit healthier. But having said that, in a recent paper we published in Nature Medicine with Jim Kirkland, this combination of dastatinib and quercetin given to mice starting at two years of age, which may be equivalent of 65, 70 in humans, somewhere in that range, that actually extended their maximal lifespan. Mm -hmm. 
so it wasn't a huge effect. It was only 10%, but that extended both the median and maximal lifespan and improved readouts such as treadmill endurance, grip strength, just a variety of measurements of physical function. And we're now trying to look and see if there's improvements in cognitive ability. That was not measured in the first study, but that's now being looked at. And I'm assuming we're going to see improvements there too. So I think we can extend maximal lifespan as well as health span. The question is how much. The key is we want to compress this time of morbidity so yeah. that we just don't want to just delay this period of morbidity. We want to compress press it. So again, you're playing golf and die of a heart attack at 110 sort of approach. My grandma had a pretty good life. She died at 102. Oh, good for her. She had most of her hobbies with her until she was probably 98. She was a painter. So her eyesight really failed her. So she couldn't paint as well as she'd like. And I think some of her zest for life started to go, but she had a long life of good health. And then it was sort of a rapid decline relatively versus decades of disability. And she's my hero in a lot of ways, but that's what I would want for myself and for most people, just a a long, healthy life. And I'm so glad that this work is going to be contributing to that. I'm really confident that it will. If you look at somebody that's 102, there's a good chance that she had some, um, you don't use the word mutations, but variants in certain genes that contribute to that. And we actually have a study where we're trying to do genomic analysis of centenarians and supercentenarians to identify what those variants are. This yeah. is being done in collaboration with people at Albert Einstein, and then trying to develop drugs that mimic the effects of the variants. That's kind of a long-term goal, but it may mean that you've actually inherited some of those beneficial variants, and so you might enjoy that same longer lifespan too. Go grandma. Yeah, go grandma. <laughs> you have to hope it was passed down the right way if you got the right genes and not the wrong ones. Totally. Well, maybe to the degree that mitochondria is super important and that comes from the matrilineal line, then again, go grandma. Yeah, <laughs> yeah go grandma. <laughs> Question real quick, and then I'll let you go. This has been fascinating. In that mice study that you mentioned with giving the desatinib and quercetin starting later in life in the mice, was that given on a daily basis or was it more pulsatile fashion? It was given intermittently. It was, if I remember correctly, every two weeks. And so again, it's something that data is consistent with the mechanism of action Mm. of the drugs given at that time is by eliminating something. That wasn't the case. You'd have to give the drug more chronically. So it appears that clearing senescent cells starting even at two years of age Mm. provides a benefit, which means there's still hope for those of us who are a little bit older than you are. Yeah. If you look in diet and nutrition, one thing that consistently seems to be a part of longer lived communities is be- of diets that are high in vegetables and fruits that have a lot of phytochemicals. And so one interesting idea is now looking at these phytochemicals pharmacologically and with combination of other drugs. But what about a lifetime of high intakes of these phytochemicals and right. that having a similar effect, but it's just harder to discern. It's an effect that accumulates over decades. Yeah, I think those questions, that long-term administration of these agents and what the effects are going to be, that those are really unknown. <laughs> you know, well, right now there's a short-term studies, but those are things that, that we'll learn going forward. It may be that you can get away giving these drug combinations very infrequently. It could be once a year might be sufficient. As we develop biomarkers to measure the senescent cell burden, we'll know who needs the treatments maybe earlier than others and then how effectively they're working. And that's what we really need. You mentioned biomarkers earlier, and mm-hmm. that's an area that has not been that fruitful in the aging space, but I think there are now hints that there are potential biomarkers that really can determine biological age and not chronological age. And there's a whole new field of digital biomarkers looking at our markers of physiological health status, which is a newer but growing field that I think can contribute meaningfully to the dialogue. So I'm excited to see the the biomarker space expand in that way as well kind of an aside, but I heard Brian Kennedy, who used to be the CEO of the Buck, but he gave a talk about a collaboration he has ongoing with somebody in Singapore mm-hmm. that's using face recognition to see if they can predict age. Mm-hmm. And yes. there's just certain facial characteristics that really let the AI that's involved in this project predict the biological age. So he was talking about using facial recognition as a potential biomarker for looking at efficacy of, of certain drug treatments. So there's going to be a lot of stuff coming yeah. that's going to allow us to predict who needs to go on more aggressive treatments and who doesn't, and then who's responding and who's not. Most people have a smartphone, so we could just do that assessment really easily, which means more people might be able to access that. Yeah, it is an exciting time. I just wish I was starting off in this field and not <laughs> further along, because I think the next 15, 20 years is going to be really exciting. Paul, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. This fascinates me, and I'm really appreciative of the work you do. We all are, and also taking the time to come chat with us. Well, I really enjoy myself, Dan. Enjoyed chatting with you. 
Thanks for listening and come visit us soon at humanos.me.